surround me and all I know Lord, and I will never change in every moment in every way oh I need you Lord and I will never change and I will never change Let's go right into praise reports. Who's got praise reports for tonight? 
Praise reports. I, yep, Cindy. on because oh my goodness you know if you look at the details of what God if you pause long enough to look at the details of how he has put his finger in your life or around your life or surrounded you with people in your life it's all in the details Amen. and so many times we miss it because we're so busy but God I'm still counting the blessings Amen. 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 Right on. All right. Praise the Lord. Right on. Prayer request. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Here, Mr. Tavern. Can I do a combo? Yep. Sweet. Um, so we have a small group of men that meet, and one of those is Bruce Blevins. He texted us about 6.30 and said, hey, my blood pressure shot up real high. Yeah. And I asked him if he needed to go to the ER, and he said, uh, I'm not sure, but why don't you come over? And I said, would you mind if we just all came over to kind of hang out with you? We did. We prayed for him. His blood pressure dropped like a rock. Um, wow. But prayer request along with that, this yeah. is the fourth spike in his blood pressure. Yeah. And the Did you say four? four? And the second after they supposedly had kind of gotten everything re-regulated. So yeah. not good. Um, he's just feeling real fatigued tonight. Just be praying for Bruce. Sure. And uh, we've yeah. got the four. Okay. We'll do. Gotcha. Yep. Should I pray for Yep. Praise the Lord. Gideon's, Gideon's recovering. Gideon's recovering. Yes. Okay. Gideon is getting better, so praise the Lord for that. Shine. I have a combo, too. Yep. Uh, it is so good to be home. We missed our church family and friends. Um, the trip did not go like we wanted to, and so on that note, please lift our family up in prayer. There's my 16-year-old niece wants to be an atheist. Every door and every window was shut right off to us. It was it was a hard trip. It was hard, but we are home, and I think I told Pastor, Lord just showed me, look, look at all your blessings, and seeing all of you and knowing we were coming to church. Right. We are so blessed to have each other and to have this Amen. building to come to. Oh yeah, because that world is lost out oh, there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So just pray for my brother and my sister, all of them. Gotcha. Will do. Okay. Okay. How about prayer? How about prayer requests? How about prayer requests tonight? Yep. Uh, praise for my granddaughter, Chelsea. She goes Monday for her court case on custody. We're still praying for Chelsea. Court case. Monday. It's happening. Yeah. Okay. And another one. Uh, baby Eliana needs lots of prayer. healthy enough to do the test. Save the Eliana. Right on. Okay. Yes, Bella? Uh, 
but your prayers are working because I'm getting around really well and uh, he changed the doctor changed some of my medication since I'm postponing the surgery and uh, so it's it's all good but I just wanted to give you an update I was doing better and yep right as long as I behave myself oh boy yeah, no chance okay mr. mr. Hamilton yes yeah, sir uh, Sunday Sue couldn't already walk uh, I didn't know what it was she didn't remember what she'd done so uh, I put out everybody pray for her and Morning, she got up, walked down. Well, she, we moved her bedroom downstairs, so we she wouldn't have to go upstairs. But she's just walking around like normal now. So praise the Lord. Thank right you. on. <laughs> praise the Lord. Right on. I remember Bill Ken. He yep. got a real bad sinus infection. The doctor put him to bed for a couple of days. Carol talked to Deb this afternoon and said he was back here. Sinus infection. Got you, Mr. Tavern. Um, Bruce also asked us to pray for Jerry and Travis. I guess they both have pretty bad colds and are feeling pretty miserable at the moment. So pray pray for both of them, obviously, that it passes quickly. Right on. Jerry and Travis also got colds. Okay. Very good. Let's go to the Lord. Lord God, we give you glory and praise. We praise you first, Lord Jesus. Yeah. We praise you and thank you for our blessings. We have several people just thankful to be here at home in the church family, Lord God. We are blessed. We give you glory. We reach out to you and praise you in our struggles, Lord God. <clears throat> it's hard to do, but we reach out and if we could even be mature enough to, to thank you for an opportunity to grow and, and uh, learn, build character, even in the middle of our struggle, Lord God. Let us look at <clears throat> everything around us to spiritualize like that. Lord God, be a, just be over Shine Stanley. Reach them, Lord God. Speak, speak to them, Lord Jesus. Do what it takes. Give shine words, Lord God. Think about our brother Bruce. We just pray for control and healing over his blood pressure. Just make it right. Do what you do there. Be with Mr. Cannon with his illness. Heal him. Get him back here with us. Keep Mrs. Cannon healthy too. Be with Jerry and Travis. Pray that they can get over their stuff, um, their cold. Just heal them, touch them, Lord God. Be with the wholesome family. They're all sick, not feeling good. That little baby, take care of them. Be with baby Eliana. Yeah. She needs to heal. Yeah. She's got a, she's got a cold, Lord Jesus. She needs to be healthy just to go to have more tests. Be with that child. Touch that child. Yeah. Heal her. Take that cancer away from her. Let her get healed up enough to go get a report that's a good report, Lord yes. Jesus. We're looking at you and that. Do your work, Lord God. Think about the little man over here with his hand scratched up. Be with him and heal him. Make it right. We lift up all these requests to you, Lord God. Together we all agree and confirm. Oh, we praise you for Gideon. Praise you for Gideon, Lord yeah. Jesus. Praise you that Gideon's healing. Be with that child. Heal that child up take care of him. Pray that he does what he's supposed to for to heal up. I pray that you speed his healing, Lord God. Just watch over Greg's whole family there. Yeah. Bless them, Lord Jesus, to grow. We lift up all these requests to you, Lord Jesus. Together we agree. We lay them before your feet. We give you glory and honor to bring our praise. Amen. Amen. Good to see you guys tonight. Let's worship the Lord.
or I don't know what's going to happen, I'm going to trust you because I've learned you have been faithful, Lord. I love to sing songs about God's faithfulness because I've tasted and seen that he's good. I've experienced his faithfulness. And when it reminds me of his faithfulness, I know I can lift up a praise because it's a remembrance of who he is. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. I trust in you. That's why I trust him. 
That's why I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior. Listen to what the Word of God is speaking to you when you read it. Lord, we thank you that we can trust in you. In Jesus' name, bless the Word of God. Amen. Let's just do it again. Let's just do that again. Hey, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming to church tonight. Church tonight. Church tonight. Good to see everybody. Uh, da, 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 da. I have nothing to say. Nothing to say. Da, da 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 I trust in God, my Savior, the one that ever Praise the Lord. God is good. The song that we just sang, He never fails. 
Hope is not just in our head, but it should be in your spirit. He never fails. How God never fails. I don't know about you, but I felt the presence of God here tonight. I did. I felt the presence of God here tonight. And uh, before I go on, in Second Corinthians chapter 10, three, it says, we walk in the flesh, but we don't fight by the flesh. Our weapons of warfare, which means there's a warfare here. Our weapons of, we of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations that exalt itself higher than the word of God. Now, all of us here have some layers of mindset that exalt itself higher than the word of God. What am I saying here? What is the word of God saying concerning your situation? Because it's exalting itself higher than what the word is saying. And that's where transformation comes in. Transformation is a warfare. What does the word say? In reality, or a fact, this is what you are experiencing. And the word says, Otherwise, is that what you have in your mind? I think you've heard me before here saying that we are in the last days and the enemy is throwing at us sicknesses, economic struggles, demonic attacks, and that's what the enemy is doing just to discredit our God. So this is what we're going to be doing. I know Pastor Mark, my big brother. He's my pastor, my big brother. By the way, I'm older than him. I just look handsome, but he's still my big brother. <laughs> this is what God willing will be doing. We want to enforce what God has done. He has not changed. He never faced. He's still healing. He's still in the business of healing. But what are we doing? Because when I hear some of the things, uh, forgive me, I'm a little bit aggressive with the things of God. Forgive me for that. Why? Because I've sinned so much. I'm trying to speak slowly so that the accent will get out of the way. <laughs> then you understand what I'm saying. Because I have a heavy heart with what I'm saying. I see too much going on young ones dying because I work in the hospital faithful people come in and I'm, I talk to them and the mindset alone is what is killing you because you don't have them when, when Paul begged the church that's the only place he actually begged the church in Romans, Romans 12 I beseech you that's me I beg you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye, what? Transformed by the renewing of what? The mind. the mind. It all starts with your mind. As a man thinketh, so he is. You think in your heart, it's in the mind. As simple as that. What is the word of God saying concerning us? And as time goes on, we start believing God for healing when we come here. When our sister is leading worship, the presence of God is here. And when you need healing, raise up your hands. People, there, there are people who are here who are gifted, but they've not started it. Amen? The, the, the gifts are for us to use. But it is only when you start, then you realize that, wait a minute, there's a God. You've heard me saying so many times that the church is supposed to be a place our final stop, we should have answers here. Every need that you have in your life, when you come here, you should get hope, you should be empowered, you should be healed, and stuff like that. That is what it is. What, that's what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be full of power and his glory. Would you agree with me? Now, some of these things, I always say, if you're desperate, you take this desperate measures. You're talking about fasting. Now, 
we all grew up with three square meals. My question is, why do they call it square anyway? Three square meals. You're not hungry, you eat breakfast. You're not hungry, you eat lunch. You're not hungry, you eat dinner. And then you can't even pray to sleep. We're going to change all that with the authority and the integrity of the word of God. Because when you starve your doubt, the only way you can starve it is you feed your spirit. And we as Christians, when you talk about Christianity, it's a kingdom. Christianity is a kingdom. In the kingdom, you are here, but you have a kingdom mindset. Does that make sense? And in the kingdom, that is where we are victorious. That's where, and in the kingdom, there are weights and parts. The Bible says in, the, I think, Psalm 103, around 10, the Lord, he showed Moses the ways. But the Israelites, he just showed his blessings. There's a way that as Christians, we should walk in. And the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems to be right in the eyes of men, but the end of destruction. So there is a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. Amen? So if he says the way, the way is salvation. The truth is the word of God. My people perish because they lack knowledge. We are his people, aren't we? Are you not his people? So why aren't we seeing the victories and seeing the power and the glory in our lives? Paul said something. He said, I consider everything foolish that I might know him and the power of his glory. Church, we are settling for less. We are settling for less. Amen? If we reign, we are kings. Royal priesthood. That we are supposed to reign in life. You should have answers. Arise and shine for the glory has come. That's what the Bible says. And it says Gentiles will come to who? You. And when they come to you, you are crying. Hello? They come to us, we are crying. We don't have answers. Why? Because we have not been with the Lord. In Acts chapter 3, 4, when the, 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 those, the, the cripple was sitting by the roadside, what did the disciples say? They said, silver and gold have I. But in the name of Jesus, get up. Where were they coming from? They were coming from prayer meeting. They were powered. They were empowered. So the Lord says, wait on me and let me give you power. Amen, church? That's what our church is supposed to be. To be on fire for the Lord. People walk in here, you walk by people are like, there's something about this man. There's something about this lady. Oh, when they come to you, you have a word to give them. And that word should liberate them. Oh, where's Brother John? The whole factory. Where's Brother John? John shows up and the glory of God hits. He didn't share a word. He just showed up and the presence of God was there. I just want to create a hunger in us. There are sometimes I stand up and say things boldly. But the question is, are they doing what you are saying they should do? Because I spoke to somebody. I mean, you go to the hospital and doctors probably will give you some medication and stuff like that. And you're like, ah, no, I'm not taking this. I'm not taking this. That's what we do at church as well. Pastor Mark will come and pour his heart. And then he says, the word he speaks does not benefit you because you do not mix it with faith. Amen? We hear the word all right, but the word is not benefiting us. Why? Because you're not mixing in the faith. What is faith? Faith is believing what the word of God says. And engaging with the word of God. There are principles. God willing, we are going to be, by God's grace, we're going to be teaching about divine healing because I have experienced it. It's going to be how to keep your healing. We can pray for you here and receive your healing. Guess what? But how to keep that healing? Do you get it? Because in John chapter, John chapter 4, when Jesus met that guy who's been sick for 18 years and stuff like that, he prayed for the guy. The guy was healed. In chapter 5, 14, he saw him and said, Oh, you're here? He goes, Go and sin no more. Why? What, if you, 
worse can happen to you. That's what Jesus said. And it's happening to us. Because you've received your healing and you don't know how to keep it. So the enemy, because the Bible says that when the enemy is driven away, he goes and roam, 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 and comes back with strong spirit. Amen? So we can bring a man of God here and he will come and manifest the healing power of God. He goes and everybody gets sick again. <laughs> Why? Because they don't know how to maintain it or how to keep your, your, your healing, the gift that has been given to you. So I just want to encourage you that when you are coming here, God willing, we are going to be expecting the move of God. You come here sick, whilst our sister is ministering and stuff like that, you raise your hands. You'd be surprised because it says your expectations shall not be cut off. You come here without expectation, guess what? You go back the same. But you come with expectation that you are coming to receive of God because he says, that's what he says, in his presence, there's what? Fullness of joy. In his presence, there's liberty. In his presence, there's deliverance. There's healing. We should expect that when we come in. Let God have your way. I surrender. My struggles, God can meet me here. Amen? So we have to, I just want to encourage you. All is like pump you up and be like, you know what? God, he's no respecter of persons. If he did it for John, he can, did it, he can do it for me too. So I stand on that word. And he will never fail me. In spite of whatever anybody says, no, what does the word of God say concerning what we are going through? I just want to encourage you. I'll be like, you know what? God, I was encouraged when my brother said, they went, they gathered themselves and prayed. And the blood pressure went down. Hallelujah. It should be a consistent thing. That I should be bold enough and say, forget that hospital. Don't go there. Amen? But I might be in trouble because if I tell you what to do, you won't do it. Do you get it? Yeah. I was, I'll say, don't go to the hospital. But what I'll tell you to do, you might not do it. So you will die and go to heaven. <laughs> do you get it? Yeah. So we want to encourage you guys to be like, listen, this is the way. Do this. Do this. Do this. Because some people, uh, yesterday I spoke to a, a nice family. And he was asking me questions. And I wasn't getting angry. I was with him all night, so I wasn't getting angry. But he's like, okay, why this? If God can do this, why would you? There are places where God says, let not your heart be troubled. He's not going to do it for you. Can I go to the restroom for you? No. I'll show you where it is. It's a choice. Let not your heart be what? Troubled. How can I let not my heart be troubled? What does the word? I put the word in here. And my heart won't be troubled. In John, in Hebrews chapter 2, 14, it says, He overcame the fear of what? Death. He overcame the fear of death. So, fear. The moment you overcome fear, you've gotten over everything. And somebody said, uh, I have not read it, but they said, fear not is in the Bible 365 times. Is that what it says? 365. Every day, fear not. <laughs> but we get up afraid. Every day, fear not. He will never fail me. He will never fail. Have you listened to a song for so long and you find yourself singing it? <laughs> Amen? That's what faith comes by hearing and hearing. The same thing fear comes by hearing and hearing. You'll be walking nicely, no problem laughing, and then you walk to the doctor's office, and the doctor says, oh, there's a lamp here. Guess what? He's messed your day. For the rest of the week, you're going down. You're going down. And probably there's nothing there. I'm serious. Probably there's nothing there. But words are powerful. Speak what you want to say. Not what you're saying. That's what faith is. When God will he said, let there be, it was dark. And he said, let there be light. And he saw light. David in 2 Corinthians 17, 50, he kept telling Goliath, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to do this. And so what he said, we are snared by the words of our mouth. As Christians, what you're supposed to speak is the word of God. Proverbs 6, you are snared by the words of your mouth. What you say, the enemy takes it and work against you because you said it. 
Bible says, whose report would you believe? Whose report would you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. What does the Lord say concerning me? Amen? Now, church, we know. What, you're tired? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I, I just want, seriously, I just want, on a serious note, I want to encourage you guys and be like, listen, the word of God is the of final authority in your life if you claim to be Christian. Don't let it collect dust. Because I know some of you, your Bible, you don't pick it up until you're coming here, you pick it up. You don't pick you, you don't look to, into your Bible until you come here. You pick up your Bible and then clean the dust and then you come in here. You won't win. No. Bible says that the enemy is roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may do what? Devour. Which means not everybody. Seeking whom he may do. So which means not everybody. The only people that they are winning are people who are in the word. And the word in them. He says that let the word of God dwell in you richly. What's dwelling in you? Your TV? Your sitcoms? Is that what is dwelling in you? Church, if we want to see the glory of God, no. It takes more than just coming to church. It's you saying that God, here I am, use me, whatever it will take, God, do it. In me. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, keep, praying, keep praying for Pastor Mark when he will start detailing stuff for people to do. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? No. Pastor Mark loves the church so much that he does everything. I'm serious. He does everything. But you know in the Bible, uh, Jethro, which was Moses' uh, father, he said, he just Jethro said, Jethro said, son, do tell somebody to do it. <laughs> now listen, he's challenging us. We need it. Right? You're not going to receive things from God, hey, until you start believing the things that God said. Right? I, I'm a big believer. You're not going to get any more than you can believe for. Right? And if you're stuck in a holding pattern, it's time to change. It's time to go to that new place God has for you. Right? Does that, does that make sense? And, and just being human, we tend to get in a routine, we tend to get in a pattern. But the things come along in life because God's trying to elevate something in us, right? God's trying to, you know, we read that verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5. It said, uh, these momentary trials are not worthy to compare to the things that God is trying to do, right? That has a far greater weight in glory. So the hardest thing to do is to move people. As a public speaker, the hardest thing to do is move people from where they are into a new place, right? Seeking God for new things. But if you'll take the next step, God will meet you there. He will. He really will. And I think that's what Barnaby's trying to do. Encourage us to say, hey, don't, don't be transformed. Continue to be renewed. Right? Things of God. Today, I'm, tonight, I'm a history teacher, I guess. I got a big bunch of history to teach you and uh, the amazing things about God's Word. I... Uh, Finishing up, trying to finish up Daniel tonight, okay? Daniel chapter, I need to pray. Father, thanks for minutes together. We praise you. We do, we do. Pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be pleasing to you. Ask you, God, to be present here. Lord, I, 
I, I don't always enjoy teaching, but God, I pray that people would see as we teach tonight the unbelievable, I incredible understanding of the sovereign God about things to come, about things that are. And Lord, you know everything. You, you, you've got a hold of everything. You, you've got a hold of every one of our lives. I pray, God, that we just kind of understand, Lord, that the, the sovereign God knows exactly what he's doing. And he's got us in the palm of his hand. So, Lord, help us tonight, Lord, to understand some deep things, God, that you've done in the past, that you might encourage us in things in the future, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to teach some slides here. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 10 sets up Daniel chapter 11, okay? Daniel chapter 11, I just kind of pulled a verse from the top of it. Then a mighty king shall arise. An angel is talking to, to uh, Daniel in a dream, and Daniel records this. And it, it says, A mighty king will rise who will rule with great dominion, and do not do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven. Daniel prophesied about this kingdom that would come. It turned out to be Alexander the Great in this year. So, what is that? Over 200 years before, Daniel said, this king shall arise and do whatever he wants. And his, his kingdom will be broken into four pieces. Okay? And Alexander died at like 32 years old. Alexander the Great died at 32 years old, head of this Greek empire. And... Uh, his kingdom gets broken into four places. I'll show you a map here, the next slide, the next screen. Here's what happens. When he, he conquers this whole area of the world, and uh, his kingdom gets split in four, four ways. The ones I want you to notice tonight is this, this P is silent, Ptolemaic Empire, and Seleucid, how do I say that? Seleucid empire okay and what's crazy is they butt together right here in Israel right so we start seeing in this uh, passage a king of the north fight with the king of the south fight with the king of the north fight the king of the south and I'm not going to go into all that but there's a hundred and thirty four prophetic things about this war and it would turn this way and that war and it would turn that way and the king's daughter would marry the the the, the and all that stuff is in this chapter Give me the next slide here. And it goes like this. Here was the beginning of it. Then there was this first Syrian war. Then there was a second Syrian war. Then there was third Syrian war. Fourth Syrian war. And the dates are there and all this. Daniel records this in Daniel chapter 11. And it comes to pass exactly. Now sometimes in the Old Testament we begin to see that God had such a foreknowledge that 200, over 200 years before these things came to pass, that was at the beginning of these things. So the, all this stuff is many more hundreds of years beyond the 200 year mark. God tells Daniel, he records it in chapter 11, and it's every war, every back and forth, everything, and they're fighting over, right over top of the land of Israel. Understand that? And uh, he does this, and then he begins to spin into the final king. And that final king is a type of an Antichrist figure that's coming. So as he talks about this final king here in chapter 11, it starts to blend into what a future Antichrist is going to be. Does that make sense? So I jump down to the end of the chapter knowing that the history here, you have to read it for yourself. It's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth predicted exactly. Let's look at this next slide. Here's how this chapter kind of lays out. Conflict between the north and the south, chapter 5 through 20. We get to this guy. Tell me how to sell that name. Say that name. Which one? Antiochus. That's it. I, I know this stuff and I get up here and can't read it when I see it. Uh, this fella is a type of a future Antichrist. He has a abomination of desolation he rules in Jerusalem there's a temple there he sets up the god Zeus in the temple and then sacrifice to the pig in the Jewish temple 
to Zeus, okay? So we see these verses, and what's starting to happen is once we get out of this, this history lesson of all these wars and stuff and move down to this guy, this guy starts to become a, a type of the Antichrist. That makes sense? And then we begin to move from him right down the church ages here. And we move right down into the one who will be the Antichrist. You see that whole thing? I think if you understand, I think this is a pretty good chart. In Daniel 11, 134 prophecies fulfilled exactly in history. You think if God got one right, it'd be pretty good, right? But to get 134 in a row in one chapter, right, exactly? You know, Cleopatra, a whole bunch of people are meant. This is in the 400 dark years there, you know, where there's not things recorded in the Bible. That makes sense. You know, Malachi writes, and then there's 400 years there. And these are the kingdoms. These are the things, the kings. Daniel writes about that all in the future. It's so crazy. It's so unbelievable that God predicted, that God said every military movement, every war, who would win, who would be the king, how the, how, who would be the, the lady, who would be all this stuff. And if you read it, it's kind of hard to understand. I'm trying to simplify it a whole bunch. But there's 134 prophecies fulfilled exactly in this chapter. Okay? Next one. The law of double reference is the tendency of Scripture prof prophecy to sometimes refer to two events or people simultaneously. So we move into this situation, as we're going to start to read, where there's this guy, Epiphany, uh, uh, what's his name? That guy, the guy, the first, yeah, that guy, that guy. Um, and what's being said about him ends up being, a, what do they call it, a dual reference, a dual so it's talking about the original guy that did these bad things at the same time beginning to talk about a future Antichrist is going to do the same thing. So we see it all the time in, in Bible. We see an Old Testament event being paralleled in the New Testament. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? The flood is a type Hey, of salvation or rapture. Does that mean... You know what I mean? The righteous were taken out. And there's all kinds of these types and stuff. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it, you know, the Old Testament is a pattern, a, a shadow of the things that will come. In, in all the Jewish holidays and all the stuff that we see, God is showing us something in the Old Testament, hey, that ends up being very true in the New Testament, right? So we pay attention to the things that, that are being said, especially about the things into the future, because I think we're going to live in them. That makes sense? Okay, next slide here. So the book of Daniel. We get to chapter 21. We're talking about that Anaachus Epiphius, whatever it is. We talk about that guy for some verses. Then we talk about the abomination of desolation where he sacrifices a pig to Zeus. We know there's another one in the tribulation, right? The rise of the Antichrist are these verses, and the time of the tribulation are these verses. Just trying to break this chapter 11 down because it's a historical chapter. And we see this dual reference, this dual, this paralleling thought between then and now, or then and what's coming. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so we'll begin to read here. I don't think I have another slide. Okay, yeah, I do. That's, that's that guy's lifetime, the, the, the first type of an antichrist. He tries to change, you know, the future antichrist will try to change the times and the season, try to change how they worship, but try to change, so... The first guy, this is talking about the, the first type of Antichrist, does these things. He destroys some things. He prohibits sacri uh, Sabbath worship, daily sacrifices. You know, that's the same thing that's been foretold about a future Antichrist. You get all that? So we get to the verses here. You mean, let me set the next slide. So I know we're moving on here. Okay. And the forces shall be mustered by him. And he shall defile the sanctuary fortress then... They shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. That's the recorded history, hey, of this first Antichrist type person, right? But we're starting to blend into the thought it's going to happen again into the real, the future Antichrist. You catching all that? Am I too heavy for you? Are you okay? It's really amazing. The Bible is very amazing. You know, I remember... Just being a, a student in Sunday school all my life. And I 
I, I started Bible college. And I started to realize in Bible college, I don't know nothing. I know every kid's story. I know every Old Testament story. I know some, some famous verses. I know the, the, the whole New Testament pretty well. But when I started to study and learn these things and realize that God, hey, was in all of these things in such great detail, and he, and he just... How can a God, how can God give us a type of a man and, and he does the thing and then thousands of years later, how can he talk about this man at the same time be talking about this one in the future? And I look at that stuff and I say, only God can do that. We're talking about the word of God and only God can do that. Right? Barnaby's trying to tell us, only God can do what we need. Only God can meet our needs. God's our savior and God's our healer and God's our helper. God's our strength. God's our encourager, Right? He's been doing it throughout history. He can do it for us in this day, right? I'm trying to show you that God knew history. He even he played a, a first version. Now he's playing a second version, right? Because that's how he does it. He shows us something in history. Hey, and then it's revealing something in the future. It's such an amazing thing. I remember going home from Bible college, tears in my eyes saying, Lord... I never knew. I never knew how great you were. I never knew, Lord, how you had history. You had the history of the world in the palm of your hand. How you knew the kings. How you really knew every king. You knew who everyone would go up. You knew everyone would go down. How you do what you do. How, how you've ordained the United States of America. And how you've used us. And Lord, in this season, your ordaining is what's happening now. As we get closer to the Lord's return... It's going to be all about Israel. It's going to be all about him. Right? All about them. Okay. So, here we are. Seeing that first abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong, carry out great exploits. So, in the day, those that trusted in God did these great things. And as the Antichrist comes to power, there'll be people that trust in God in the future. And they'll do great things. Right? You believe, I don't know. I was a mere mortal. Until the Lord came in. I don't know where you've all been. I don't know what's happened all in your life. But I've been able to speak to a dead man and he got up. Right, and I lived 11 more years. I've been able to speak to a mountain and it disappear into a sea. I've been able to speak over demon possessed people and demons flee. I've had all kinds of the Bible experiences in my life. I, I know who God is. I, listen, I've been trusting God my whole The God of the Bible is still the God of the Bible. Right? And Christians are going to be able to do great things. You see it right there? No matter what the devil's trying to do, there's a bad guy coming on the scene. No matter what the devil's trying to do, in the very worst of time, as the devil raises up to do all this evil, what's it say? But the people who know their God shall be strong. I hope we're all strong. I expect, how do I say this to you? I'm just going out there on a limb now. Maybe I shouldn't say any of this. I expect, hey, when we're doing something for the Lord, I expect a man with a sign standing out front. Right? Because we're stirring up something, right? I expect that. And the people, hey, that are not strong in the Lord will be afraid. But the people that are strong in the Lord say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're stirring up the kingdom, man. We're stirring it up. We're, we're doing God's work here. You know what I mean? Who or why would, why would the enemy do that? You know what I mean? If the enemy isn't stirred up. Guy told me one time, the devil does not know what God's about to do. But he can see the heart of people. He can see their faith rising. He can see the storm clouds coming to bring rain. 
he could see the Spirit of God coming, you know. He could see, he can measure, he knows when things are about to break. He knows, and what's the enemy do? Just before, so there's a big breakout, just before, the enemy will try to come as hard as he can to discourage, hard as he can. He'll send all kinds of stuff to stir things up. He'll send all kinds of this and all kinds of that, because the enemy, hey, is, is evil. But the people who know their God shall be strong. Not afraid. Not afraid. God knows my first day. God knows my last day. Something happens to me. Don't you be sad. Don't you be sad. You just be committed. Hey, I'll be standing there at the gate waiting on you. You know, I'll already be up the cul-de-sac trying to get things ready for you. I'm just trying to say not that I'm planning on leaving. I feel like the Lord has spoken to me, said the Lord would come in my lifetime. I'm telling you, you don't have to believe that for you, but I know that's true for me. That's what I just know, okay? That I would see his glory and, and, and he would come, right? That's what I believe in my lifetime. I'm standing on that. I believe that, that God has a lot of glory to show in this place to a lot of people who are, are tr people who trusted him. And the, the children, the people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits, Right? We're not afraid to go into the public schools. We're not afraid to go into the jungles of Peru or the places of Nicaragua or, or, or do the work that's got to be done in Haiti. <laughs> Times of trouble, you should shine the brightest. Right? I get to get through a history lesson here. And those people who understand shall instruct many. The people who understand will instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now this is in the time of... of, of of Antiochus Epiphany and in the time, future time of a Antichrist. Okay? Now, when they fall, they shall be added because in the tribulation, Christians are going to get killed. Right? And when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join them by intrigue, meaning the more that fall, the more that will come on. Right? And some of those of understanding shall fall, fa fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end because it is still for an appointed time. Now, I have a video I'd like to throw in here. Time is going to run out on me, but I want to show you this video of a guy teaching some descriptive terms about the Antichrist, okay? The next few verses are descriptive terms about the Antichrist, okay? And I'm going to play that video. He does a real good job at it. I like the guy, he's a preacher, so we'll just play this fellow, okay? Got a video now, for you right starting now. Starting in verse 36, we have a shift in our prophecy. We have a shift that's common in the understanding of biblical prophecy. And let me explain this to you. Many times in the Bible, when it gives prophetic statements, it'll give prophetic statements both for a shorter fulfillment and a longer fulfillment. There will be aspects in there that will be fulfilled in a short term and some aspects that will be fulfilled in a long term. Most of everything that we've read in Daniel chapter 11 up to verse 35 has dealt with things that were fulfilled before Jesus ever came to this earth. Both in the last times of the Old Testament, historically speaking, and in the period between the two Testaments. But when you get to verse 36, now you start talking about things that are yet to come at the very end times. Because as we've discussed before, this fellow, Antiochus Epiphanes, this great persecutor of the people of God, this man who desecrated the temple of God, th th this man who did all these terrible things against God's covenant people, this man is a foreshadow 
of a future world leader who will follow in his footsteps. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. Look at that phrase in verse 36. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. 36. That, that's a radical statement. And you could say, in a sense, it was fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes, but not in its fullness. Because, brothers and sisters, when Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue in the temple of God in Jerusalem, what is it? What was it a statue of? Was it a statue of himself? No, it was a statue of Zeus. Even in that he was exalting the Roman and Greek gods, he wasn't exalting himself above the gods. But here God is giving us a clue to a future fulfillment by saying, there is going to come a guy along the model of Antiochus Epiphanes, and let me tell you what he will do. He will exalt himself above every god. He won't say, the whole world must worship Zeus. He'll say, the whole world must honor and worship me. And here we see the shift from what was fulfilled in ancient times to what is remaining to be fulfilled. This man, Antiochus Epiphanes, prefigures the ultimate evil man. The man who is sometimes called in the scriptures, but popularly called in the culture, the Antichrist. And this man, this coming world leader, he is the feature film. Antiochus Epiphanes was just the trailer telling you what was in the feature film. Again, verse 26. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. The Antichrist and Antiochus would do much damage, but only until God stopped them in their tracks. Now, starting at verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. He shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Now notice this, verse 37 says, of both Antiochus and Antichrist who is to come, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Here's what I want you to hear. Now, in any biblical passage, there's a lot of different ways that people think to interpret it, especially passages like this. And I myself as a preacher, sometimes I debate how much I should tell you about interpretations I don't agree with. Because if I don't agree with them, then why would I tell you about them? I, I mean, but then again, sometimes I just want you to know that another interpretation is out there, even if I don't agree. Let me tell you about an interpretation that is out there, and I think maybe it's a slight possibility it's true, but, but I really don't buy into it in the big picture. When you take a look at verse 37 of Daniel chapter 11, it says of this coming world ruler, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Some people have thought on this, and again, I, I don't, I, I think it's slight possibility, but it's not how I would go with the passage. They think based on this, that number one, this coming world leader will be Jewish in heritage, because it says he shall not regard the God of his fathers. Secondly, they believe he'll be a homosexual because it says, nor the desire of women. Now, I believe that both of those could be and probably should be understood in a different way. That the God of his fathers would just mean whatever God he grew up with, not necessarily the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that phrase, the desire of women, in a couple places in the Old Testament, it's used not to refer to sexual desire, it's used to refer to the Messiah. Because the Messiah in Jewish culture was thought to be the one who was desired among women to be their descendant. 
In the whole Jewish world, God promised that he would bring forth the Messiah from the Jewish people and there would be one woman chosen from all the Jewish people throughout the centuries to be the mother of the Messiah. And this was the desire of woman, to have that honored place of being the Messiah. It's another way, in other words, of referring to the Messiah himself. So it's very likely that this should be understood. He won't regard his traditional God, and he won't regard the Messiah. But I at least want to throw the possibility out there That's that good, some right people there. believe that this coming world... Very quickly, I want to go to chapter 12. There's only four big verses here that... There are more verses there um, about the Antichrist. Chapter 12. And at that time, Michael shall stand up, a great prince who watches over the sons of your people. We learn from that verse that... There's a great angel named Michael that's watching over the Jewish people. Why is that important? You ain't going to beat him. What's happening in the Middle East is not going to beat him. You want to be on the side of Israel because Michael is for them. And there shall be a time of trouble. We're talking about the tribulation such as never was since the, there was a nation. Even at that time, and at the time of the people shall be delivered. And at that time, the people shall be delivered. And at that time, the people shall be delivered. Michael is going to defend them. And everyone who's found written in the book, meaning the believers also. Now, this is referring to a time in the future. It gives us some spiritual understanding about what's happening with Israel, right? The United States, just here and today, um, has withheld some shipments of weapons to Israel because the United States doesn't want them to continue to go into Rafah and do what they're doing. And I just say to you, we need to be on God's side, Right? goes on here and you can read it but Daniel begins to ask questions about this and many shall sleep on the earth some shall wake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt what, what are we talking about there when people wake up you know at the end of the tribulation there's a judgment a great judgment right some to everlasting life some, those who will rise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now that's a Pentecostal shouting verse right there. Right? Those who are wise shall shine like the bright. You're out here in church on a Wednesday night because you're wise. Right? Faithful church attendance, hey, is one of the wisest things you can do. It'll stir you up in some way. It'll speak to you somehow, right? It'll move you in some way. And those that are wise will gather together, hey, and gain uh, encouragement and strength from one another, right? And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars, stars forever and ever. And I wish I could just go on and on and on. I have many, many, many things to say. But time just gets away from us. I do have one more verse, I think. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal them up till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. We're at, we're at the point right here. Look at this. Knowledge doubled from 100 to 1700 in that 1800 year, 100 BC. 18, it doubled over 1800 years. From 1700 to 19, it doubled in 200 years. Then it doubled in 50 years. Then it doubled in 20 years. Then it doubled in 10 years. It doubled in 8 years. They're saying right now in this moment, the latest statistics, all the knowledge of the world is doubling every 11 hours. It's not necessary in wisdom. Knowledge 
will greatly increase. I, I got to let you go, but there's just some interesting facts and figures. We just run out of time tonight. I'd love to share all this stuff with you. The great thing is God predicted 134 prophecies exactly. And he goes on to tell us the things that would happen in the end. If you get a chance to catch up with that, I'm not going to come back to Daniel again here, okay? Catch up with that because there's many things written about the, the Antichrist that will come. We're not going to be here for that. Right? But he tells us a lot about what's coming. Father, we thank you for time together. Taught a little history lesson tonight. Taught about the, just the, 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 the impossibilities of the Word of God, the... The, the, the sovereignty of your word, how you know, you know, have a foreknowledge of things to come. How you're trying to awaken your people, Lord, that, that you were in control then and you're in control now. And the very things, Lord, that are playing right now are the things that are playing at the time of the end. Lord, I'm not trying to scare a Wednesday night crowd at all into salvation, but I am trying to encourage them that you got the whole world in the palm of your hand. That you know what's next, you know what the maneuvers are. Lord, you preordained it. God, the, the choice that needs to be made is where will we be and what will we do in day-to-day decision-making, Lord, that we might be movers and shakers in the kingdom of God. And those that know their God will do great exploits. And those that understand the word will bring many to righteousness. So, Lord, I pray we're among those people that we do great and mighty things, that we have faith for great and mighty things, that we're encouraged, Lord, that the God who knows it all, does it all, is, is our Father. And, Lord, that we begin to walk beyond the level place we are now into the deeper things of God so you might reveal to a world that you're truly God in this day. We thank you for time together. Pray for everybody in this place that's fighting a battle. Everybody, Lord, you, you've, you've allowed it, God, that we might grow in it. Teach us, Lord, how to change to go to another level, to seek you more. And, God, you will reward that with great things in our life. We'll give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. We love you. Come back. That wasn't much. You give me too much there. I prayed for a minute.